this recording now. I'm convinced I'm sure a few more are drifting the next five minutes or so. You can sort of glare at them for their hardiness when it comes to fighting. Welcome to this uh, not the Dean Thomas Doyle lecture guys, the special welcome to those from outside the University of Edinburgh and the faculty students. You all know one of our visiting professors in the faculty here uh, at an important visiting professors have this important role to play in the university life and life and TV. They give an external perspective that often like the industry perspective of the kind of employability and help ensure that the uh, academic staff are up to speed with um, current thinking and practice, we hope. So those yeah. are some of the roles that visiting professors play. So once you've um, once once sorted yourself yeah. back in, yeah. we'll hand over to Steve. Okay, thank you for coming along. Uh, for those of you who have come um, to um, listen to me go on um, for about 40 minutes, I hope. Um, the, the lecture I'm going to give, um, I, I started to write about a month or so ago and tried to bring in some elements of where data is going and how it's all fitting into the world of architecture. Uh, and, and I originally said, well, what do I call it? And it's, where will the data take us is, seems to be quite apt because at the moment we have virtually no idea. Um, and then I started to think about it and I started to look at um, other titles and what seemed seem apt to me was the times they are changing. Um, uh, a poem of Bob Dylan. Um, and I, I looked at it and I thought, yeah, that's probably right. Because although the, the first one is a pun of Bob Dylan, uh, the second one is, or the original statement, was really a question we should be asking um, about where all this data is taking us. Because to be honest, I don't think many people understand. They're still trying to sort it out. Um, Mace van der Rohe is, a, is an architect that I particularly quite like. Um, I've, I've studied him quite intensively over the years. And I, Travelled through architects' practices all over the UK, and well, in Birmingham, and then across into Switzerland and France, and wherever I've worked. Um, and, and, and quite famously, it, he said, "God is in the detail." Whether he actually started that that, that phrase, I, I'm not too sure. Um, but it certainly it's been uh, landed in his lap. Um, but I'm asking the question: um, Should it be um, God is in the in the data? Because that is really what is happening. Um, but first a little history about myself. Um, as you know, my name is Steve Scagebrook. Um, I'm a Chartered Architectural Technologist by training. Um, I was around in CIAT in one of the early days of MSAT. So uh, SAT was formed in 1965-66 and I joined in 1969. Um, I started life as an architect's practice called Ken Dalton. And um, many people didn't particularly like it. Um, <laughs> I think she was just probably underestimating <laughs> Yeah, I speak rather nice to him. Um, but he was a good architect, and he taught me an awful lot in the years that I worked there. Um, I was a young, um, young guy from school, and I was the junior in the office. And as a junior, I had to do everything. And I learned an awful lot with Ken. Um, not just him, but the staff in the office who, who were instrumental in teaching me a lot of the standards I now hold to quite true. Um, but 
And it's that word again, you'll hear me say it many, many times. Um, as we worked away at the board, I think there were many things that we just did not appreciate um, that were gonna happen in my career. It just did not seem possible. Um, for those of you who are quite interested in what's on the screen, and I, I might come back to this later, um, that's actually the Titanic or the Belfast Shipyard Drawing Office. Um, and it's still there, I was there a couple of years back at the, at the Titanic experience. And um, that drawing office, much the same, is there. The, the desks aren't there, um, but the hall itself is still there. Um, and they're promising to, to redo it, but as yet they haven't done it. But at this point, I was drawing on the flat 2D screen. Can I say that? The answer is probably yes, because it was. It was a flat board. Um, and I was drawing details in 2D, in pen, ink, and everything else that I was asked to do. In fact, I'm probably one of the last of the technicians that are around these days who actually used watercolor um, and drawing up elevations and just putting a bit of watercolor on the bottom of them to lift them up. And another thing that Ken, um, that uh, Ken uh, taught me. But it's this area here, CAD, um, that suddenly came up. And one of the things that I, I, quick, I keep looking at is that one of the first days that I started out, um, I joined a, a practice um, called Brian Bannister, who was an architect in, in Gridville Crescent. And he was into vector works, or what's even then, Minicad. Uh, Minicad was unique, and that it was a Mac product, so one of the few CAD program programs actually worked on, on a Mac. Um, but it had data. And so this was one of the first times that we started to see data being added into drawing. We didn't do it very often because we're still using um, drawing techniques that I learned in a 2D environment. And we're just putting it onto a CAD machine. It made things slightly quicker. For those of you who've never worked on a, on a, on a drawing board, um, mistakes were costly and time consuming because you had to scratch them off with a razor blade and then redraw them in again. It took a long time. You could spend maybe a week or so drawing something on the toe that it needed to be changed, which meant you spent two or three days scratching it out and then redrawing it again. So um, it was this time that we started to develop the idea of CAD and take it on from 2D into the 3D environment. And again, I was still with Vectorworks at this stage. And Vectorworks suddenly went at about that version 11 or 12 into into the 3D era. And it was this point we started to hang data on it in a more sensible way. Um, and people started to ban the word BIM around. And it depends on who you're talking to, whether it's building information modeling or building information management. Or even these days, British information management. I'm hearing that one come up time and again. But the use of this we're still harping back onto the old days of 2D drawing. 2D drawing is something that you have to have to experience because it gets so into you, you can't get out of it. Even when you go onto the CAD machine, you're still thinking in 2D. And that's progressed in our environment as we go through to the client because we see clients now who cannot understand 3D. And they're pushing the idea that why do they have to spend all this money in a 3D environment when for a thousand years we've still been using 2D? They don't understand this. So um, it depends on who your client is, whether they're savvy enough to understand this as to whether they're going into BIM or into 3D modeling. Um, interestingly, not many clients are there. If your client is government orientated, the answer is probably yes. Um, if your, your client is government related, in other words, they're working some way with the government, not with the government of the client, then the answer is still yes, they are into BIM. But there is a ban now of clients who are understanding that 3D and BIM and all the data that it generates is becoming more and more interesting. And they are the clients of the future, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, we 
we're also seeing new ideas come up, and that is the idea of 3D models in PDF. Um, that hasn't taken off as yet, uh, and we're talking about IFC and Kobe files as being the main generation of data from the drawings that we generate across into the contractor. Um, and it's this time in the presentation, quite early on, that I want you to get to the idea that the file sizes that we've been talking about up until now have been relatively small in the kilobytes. But as soon as we enter this realm of data, 3D drawing, and the volume of information we're hanging on it, we're starting to see um, files increase enormously. Um, Um, so, this idea of data was suddenly becoming a problem in our industry, and I'll go on to this in a little while as to how we handled this. But up to this point, um, Google came on and were a lifesaver for many practices because their Gmail account suddenly gave you 10 megabytes of file attachment that would allow a practice to work, and it was enough to allow you to send files quite easily across the email system. And that saved a lot of practices because they were still working on independent servers within, within their practice. But it's quite clear as we moved on through the industry that Pandora's box was open. We are now seeing the way that other industries were sliding along and catching up. One of them, and I'll go into it in detail later on, is the aircraft industry they progressed on their own silently out of reach of many people but they set the precedence and this change came in something we're now calling the internet of things or iot small self-powered little sensors that feed data back to a central repository and this this data can be anything from temperature, humidity, movement, movement of the structure, as well as movement of cars, people, objects, whatever. Even cloud cover, we can actually put sensors up now that measure the amount of cloud cover that's coming across. And some of these sensors are becoming almost domestic mainstream. Bell covers, so you press the button and it rings inside the house, little Bluetooth signal comes in and rings a bell within there, no wiring. And also, it's internet connected, so a little picture comes up on your, your phone, someone's at the door. And you can say, yeah, leave the parcel there, you don't have to be there, you'd be on your phone somewhere shopping. And the growth of these objects is becoming exponential. They're suddenly becoming everywhere. We've expanded now from the domestic side out, and these sensors are becoming everywhere. I've got them in my house where we're looking at small little objects in the hall that measure the temperature inside and outside quite easily. And it's just a 20 quid device. They are not expensive any longer. But the interesting thing is that we're now taking these not only as devices for the domestic market, but into commercial, industrial buildings. And these buildings are now becoming part of a big city. And the city is taking this information partly because of the spread of uh, glass fiber. So the internet is now being spread across the city and the cities are becoming smart. It's a word I don't like to use because the cities aren't smart. They're just becoming data aware. And algorithms, which I'll talk about in, in depth, are becoming more and more the item that, that is now powering this, this smart city scenario. So, one last area that I want to start um, in thinking about is the way that, at the moment, I've only talked about individual buildings as part of this 3D environment and the data. 
But these buildings are not only going to talk to the city as a whole, but each other trying to evaluate free energy, movement, and other information that the buildings require. That's a smart TV. Okay, this is the one area that suddenly it, it dawned on me that we have quite an interesting problem going on, and that is data conversion specialists. These are the people that we're now seeing arriving, they call them BIM specialists now, but I think that word is going to die, simply because of the amount of information they're going to have to start to deal with, as well as the building environment. And I quite like the idea of calling them data conversion specialists. They're looking at not only the way that they're handling the data that we generate in our drawings, but the integration of that data into the building model and how that building model within the building, wherever it may be stored, and don't forget, we could be looking outside the building, how that information is checking third-party information stores of data that's going to be useful in the way that the interpretation goes on of what we've generated in our drawings. And now we are really getting into big data size. We are talking incredibly big amounts of data. We're probably, most of us, in the terabyte range for individual data. My Mac has got one terabyte of data on it, and I'm about 50, 60 percent full, together with all the other stuff that I've got hanging on Google and other sticks and odd devices in my home. But there are people, quite easily, talking about the petabyte and exabyte. My son works for SAP, and he's certainly into this latter area of petabyte information. It's, it's just massive amounts. But by the time you leave this room and start to think about it, we're going to be up into this area here. Not zettabytes, but what they're now calling yottabytes. This is the amount of data that the globe is quite happily storing. And they're counting it in zettabytes and yottabytes. If you listen to the, 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 the computer or architectural computer industry, this is the sort of stuff that they're thinking about. And the amount of data is becoming incredible. Um, I would happily point you to, and I'll read this out because I want to get it right, is to an excellent paper by a, a, a chap called John Foley. Um, and it's titled, and you'll search for it on the internet, as As Big Data Explodes, Are You Ready for Yellowbytes? It's available as a paper to download, and if you're in university, you should be able to get it quite easily. Um, and he quite happily says, by the time you read his, his article and finish it, that the world will be in yellowbytes. Let's take ourselves back now to, um, to the actual drawing process that we've got. And the, the way that we're starting to look at the information we're embedding into our drawings. You probably recognize this as being Betterworks. And it's a system called Marionette. Marionette is quite interesting. It came out two versions ago. And I am a beta tester for Betterworks and I see what's going on in the future versions, the latter end of 2017 and 18 as it's come out. And this is now recognizing the amount of data that we've got in here and setting rules for both the 2D and the 3D use of the drawing that we are using and generating. Marionette is not the only one on the market. Um, we can look at AutoCAD's version Archicad's version. Archicad, by the way, is a product that's been around for as long as Vectorworks, and they have been hanging data onto their drawings just as long as we have. But this is becoming interesting, because now not only are we just hanging data on, but we're setting up rules within the drawing that gives us information. At present, Marionette doesn't extend beyond the drawing itself. But I can assure you, and in fact I know so, that they are extending this out into the outside world. As you export the IFC file, or actually use their own system to export, you're gonna take a lot of this scripting language with it, which will assist 
the model as it evolves outside of the drawing model. I just want to, to take this a little bit further. I sit on a group called Heritage, and it's Benfer Heritage. And Benfer Heritage is looking at older buildings. We draw and design buildings for around the 60 year lifespan. In fact, when I was working at Jim Roberts, one of the buildings I actually worked on then has just been pulled down in Newall Street. So, 40 years, 35, 40 years, it's likely before they've actually renewed it. But we generally see buildings lasting much longer than this. So 60, 100, 200, and in certain cases, 300 years old. And I can guarantee you that practices who design these buildings rarely, if ever, go back. It's a sad, it's a sad reflection in our industry that we design these buildings, we put them up, we say, thank you very much, client. Here's your building, we have a party. And we never, ever go back into that building to see how it's fared. I actually take people around on my courses, and two of my students here from past years will have been dragged around in the cold in the winter to see how a building has operated. We've got the excellent examples of Bigfoot down the road. It is full of buildings that have survived two world wars and a number of city-wide changes. And the stuff you can see there, how it survived, why materials have worked, why they haven't worked, detailing this work, detailing they haven't worked. But data suddenly gives us a whole new aspect of working with a building in terms of how it might work before we've let it out to the client and how it will work later on as we put sensors into the building, feed information back. And that is the key to this statement, in that this scripting language can now take the language of the outside world and bring it back in again. You know, the detail of your this case, ain't working too well, here's the reasons why, and a whole load of data. We can even use these scripting languages now to go out into the outside world and say, I want to use this material, how much information is out there about its use? Feed me back in. Give me the stuff. Can we get this data, if it's outside of the model, to interrogate itself? The answer is yes. Google have already shown us that they are allowing um, Hannah, Hadoop, Hannah Hadoop to... Sorry, not Hannah Hadoop. Um, Google Hadoop data analysis system that's already on some drive accounts to interrogate this mass amount of information and bring it in and start to look at it. It's quite possible that the building, once the model has been used and attached to the building, that the data could actually start to say to the designer, I think we need to update this little bit of a detail or um, the structure isn't coping as well as we want it. Can we design that into our buildings? The answer is yes, because we can actually say, okay, well, why didn't we design this with something that's interacting with the design to upgrade the strength or the stability of the building? The precedence of that is already set, because if you look at earthquake design, they quite happily put in masses of mass halfway or two thirds of the way up the building, which when the wind starts to blow, or if in, in bad cases they have earthquakes, and the building shakes, then the sine wave of the shake is actually disrupted by the movement of the mass within inside the building. Very clever. We could actually use some of this data to predict that and start the movement or in, in, in fact even stress the building up by hydraulics. Let's have a look and see if I've got sensors. So sensors, let's go back onto this idea of sensors. They're cheap as chips. They're pence each. They're not expensive. And we can start to use these and understand them. And that's why I'm looking at this idea of a data convergence specialist, to understand how we can use data generated by these little tiny things. And we've got three areas that we can start to look at. The static. 
So static really means, is it on the wall, on the floor, internally or externally? Or is it going to be one of these high up on perched on the top of a telegraph pole? And if you actually walk around Birmingham, you will see telegraph poles and lamp, sh and lamp poles with little tiny bubbles on the top. Those bubbles have got sensors in. And the sensors is feeding back temperature information, wind, sun, everything else back to a central force. Birmingham University, not Birmingham City University, but Birmingham University, have got nearly 30 of these specialist little uh, units plonked around the city. And there's actually a website now that feeds all this information together into one source. And you can see the temperatures from the south side of the city, where the prevailing weather normally comes. So you can see all this data quite easily. The second item, as far as sensors is concerned, is your mobile phone. There are 4.7 billion phones climbing daily around the globe. 83.1 million of those are actually in the UK. I quite find it interesting that we can start to use this localised data for wherever you are. And Google is get, getting quite good at this. As your phone moves from area to area, it knows where it is, whether you like it or not. And from that information, you can start to look at the temperature outside, the humidity, everything else, and start feeding it back. It brings up questions of privacy and everything else. But I think at the end of the day, if you're going to get paid for being one of the providers of the information, perhaps this, um, this, this, this problem of, of personal privacy will go away. Woo, slide power. Oh, yes, let's move on. This is a technology, and one of the questions that David and I have talked about quite often is, well, if I'm going to put these sensors in, how do I get at the sensor that's going to be deep inside the construction? Because we've scanned within, it's, it's there. I can't get at it without putting major restoration, you know, taking the wall apart, taking the sensor out, replacing it, putting it back. There's a system out there now, and this has been proved that it works. And it, it's, it's a way of taking the ambient energy in the atmosphere and collecting it and using that to burst the information out. Um, it's called backscatter technology, for those of you who want to look at it. And there are a couple of good videos on YouTube that show how this works. But backscatter technology is there and it is generating information quite happily. And it'll do this for a couple of hundred years. You don't even have to look at it. As long as the material stays put, it's not damaged by the building or water or anything else, it will continue to put out, as long as we're giving out radio waves into the atmosphere. So this is an interesting development. And this is the prototype that one of the universities has made. The paper is available. If you look it up on um, Google Scholar, you'll find the papers on this, and you'll be able to look at the way it's working. It's freely available. They've, got, they've not hidden it away in the patent. Sensors. Jet engines are quite interesting. In fact, the whole aircraft industry is incredibly interesting. One engine has got 5,000 plus sensors scattered around it. No big deal, you say. Very interesting. But those 5,000 sensors are imparting live information from the engine as it's running in the sky to the central area. And in fact, one of our new lecturers is from Derby University. And he went in there and saw planes around the world on this big screen. When you touch the screen, and the information for those engines is live on the screen. If the engine is going wrong, or it is need of service or anything, it flags it on the screen, and by the time that engine has landed, there's a crew there with all the specialist equipment to change, do, repair, whatever. So the aircraft is back in the sky in minimal time. Don't forget. If it's on the ground, it's not earning money. And this is serious money. So they get it round, turn it, shove it back up in the air as quickly as possible. 
This is, this is, this is interesting. 5,000 sensors, and I'll read this just to make sure I get it right. That's about 10, that's about 10 gigabytes of information from one engine. Add the plane as a whole with two engines and a backup at the back somewhere, then you're talking in excess of two terabytes per second channeling out of this engine into a central control tower that's understanding all this. And look at that as far as the, all the planes around the world are doing. And each of the aircraft manufacturers, Boeing, Pratt & Whitney, and all the others, are all doing exactly the same. They've nailed this item of sensor down to a very fine degree. And the precedent is set. They know how to do it, and we should be looking at them to get the, the information in. I just want to quickly go back onto the way that we're looking at data. And Google and the others are nothing in comparison to Amazon. The amount of data store that they hold is immense. I can't even find out how much they've got. But all the pundits on the marketplace are saying that Amazon, with all their information stores, is bigger than many of the other big service providers out there, Google and the others. But one of the interesting areas of all this sensor data that's been stored in any repository you like is the way that we can gather data from external agencies. And the UK government is classic at doing this. If you look at the way that the government agencies, and I'm talking people like the Met Office, they have now got an API that will drag information in. Remember I was talking about the scripts in Marionette? Marionette is quite capable of going out, looking at the Met data, and then looking at your design and saying, given this temperature range in this particular area, you're fine. Or it's not fine because you're going to leak or the wall just won't hold that amount of water coming in if it's a coastal region. So there is a new precedence being set in the way that we can look at a detail or a building as a whole and put real-time information onto that building or detail. And that real-time information is coming from the external agencies who are there. I don't know whether you, act, I think you're on the Met Office, you actually pay for it. But it's not a huge amount if you're a big practice, Foster's, AA, or one of the other big practices. They should be able to afford this sort of data coming in. Ooh, where else do I go from this? Loads of places. Um, okay, the one thing that we need to start looking at is the API, that's the Application Program Interface. So at the moment, I don't know, and I've not been told, if Vectorworks is actually going into this direction. But from conversations I've had with um, some of the technical directors there, they know of it and are working on it. So I expect to see this coming out quite soon. But there are other people now coming onto the bandwagon, as far as data is concerned. They're understanding that we can start to look at the amount of data, and they're collecting this information and they are ready to feed it out at cost. So not only do we go to government agencies, but we can go to the private agencies, and they are now feeding data 